Welcome to Nation Beat. I am Janelle Norville bringing you this brief on the pearls of our nation and highlights around the heart of St. Lucia. St. Lucia receives a vital injection of funds from the World Bank to boost healthcare services. Prime Minister the Honorable Alan Chasney states government's commitment to providing improved living standards for all nationals before a global audience. The island's Minister of Responsibility for Tourism is elected chair of the Caribbean Tourism Organization and St. Lucian exporters look to break down barriers in the Cuban market. St. Lucia made another significant stride towards a healthier population with help from the World Bank. The 20 million US dollar project aims to strengthen the island's primary health care system and begin the initial phases of the proposed national health scheme. As we hear from Alicia Ali, the first phase of the project is already being implemented. The project will focus on three components improving service delivery through a sustainable benefits package, strengthening responsiveness of public health systems to address non-communicable diseases, and managing public health emergencies. The first component, namely the essential benefits package, falls under the National Health Scheme and addresses the cost of treating non-communicable diseases. It aims to raise the quality of treatment while lowering the cost of treating diseases like cancer, diabetes and hypertension. In, in looking at our national health insurance, we look at implementing national health insurance. We have developed a benefits package. This project will be looking at that package and how we can streamline that package to make it more affordable. How we are going to look at the system we have to put in place to implement this package and also the current what financing we can get to finance that package. This project, which will be officially launched later in October, is set to revamp and innovate St. Lucia's health system. The performance-based aspect will bring about a transformative edge to the regular health system by using a reward system in pilot health centers to bolster the treatment of non-communicable diseases. Yes, we're going to strengthen our primary health care facilities in dealing with non-communicable diseases um, as a first point. So if anybody has any disease, any chronic disease, that the health centers would be equipped and capable of dealing with them as a first point instead of going straight to our secondary or tertiary healthcare institutions. The main thrust of the project is really to support the direction that the Ministry of Health is going with at this time. Because I'm sure we're all aware that we embarking on a, um, a national health insurance and of course commissioning our new health facilities. It means that we definitely have to strengthen our primary healthcare systems in order to ensure that persons do not reach the level of requiring treatment at the secondary or tertiary level. So it means that, especially if you're going to have national health insurance, we want to promise every St. Lucian citizen that there is treatment with regard to the health services being decentralized throughout our primary sector. It means that, for instance, you know, you have some institutions where you go to a wellness center and, and they would probably tell you the doctor would be available Thursday next week. We do not want that occurrence to persist. So it means that that project will help us strengthen our capacity within the primary healthcare sector that a doctor is almost always available. At the end of this project, at least close to half of the island's population will be registered as part of the National Health Scheme. Around 60% of the adult diabetic and hypertensive patients will be treated according to national protocols at primary health facilities island-wide. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, through its new strategic plan, intends to ensure that these facilities are up to international standards. From the Government Information Service, I am Alicia Ali. 
And the World Bank's approved funds to strengthen the island's public health care system comes on the heels of the government's stated commitment to providing accessible and affordable health services to all nationals. Prime Minister the Honorable Alan Chastney reaffirmed the government's position during his address to the 73rd United Nations General Assembly on Friday, September 28. We understand that the preventive and affordable health care is critical for the social development of any nation. More so as a small state with small population. We are plagued with incidents of individuals who delay in seeking early, early medical assistance due to the high cost, only to be saddled with the serious diagnosis later. Prime Minister Shastney said the government of St. Lucia is pursuing the issue from multiple angles and has drawn support from the European Union and the World Bank. The strategy also includes the implementation of policies and legislation which will give life to the national insurance scheme. A critical element of the plan is tackling non-communicable diseases. Also expanding our after-school programs that focus on building healthy lifestyles through physical activity and diet. Prime Minister Honorable Alan Chastney as he addressed the UN General Assembly in New York. Meantime, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, with the support of PAHO and other key stakeholders, held several outreach programs during the month of September with the aim of increasing awareness and sensitizing the public of the social and economic impact of non-communicable diseases. The Ministry of Health and Wellness hosted a series of activities during the month of September in commemoration of Caribbean Wellness Day. Activities began with a church service at the Odds of Pentecostal Church. Natasha Lloyd Felix is the director of the Bureau of Health Education. Health is all encompassing. It's physical, it's mental, it's emotional, it's spiritual. And so we have started off our observations with a church service at this church where we will be offering prayers for persons who are championing the cause of chronic illnesses as well as persons who are living with the conditions because we know through the support of our, our fellow spiritual leaders and through prayer many things can be healed amongst us. Following the church service was the official launch and recognition ceremony which took place at the Sanders Grand on Monday, September 10th. The primary focus of this ceremony was to recognize and award establishments who have contributed or lent support in raising awareness, sensitizing the public, and establishing health policies in order to improve the prevention of non-communicable diseases. Whilst addressing the gathering, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Merlin Fedrick said, Though the Ministry of Health is the main custodian for health matters, everyone has a responsibility. We each have an individual responsibility to do all we can to exercise more often, choose healthier foods, avoid alcohol and tobacco, and decrease our intake of sugar and salt. Nevertheless, communities, NGOs, and civil society, organizations, and business places also have a responsibility in decreasing the impact of NCDs. Your presence here today shows that you have embraced your responsibility in that regard and have led in various ways in promoting healthy behavior and decreasing the impact of NCDs. To you, we are most grateful. The food activity which took place on the 19th of September was a health fair. Family Life Educator Heidi Kodra said the department tactically took wellness promotions and health services to the vendors' arcade in Castries. She said it was pleasing to see how receptive men were to the services that were offered and it is very important for individuals to know their family history. The table was filled with men. We had the taxi drivers outside. They came, um, I did breast, um, um, prostate examinations with them. We went through the process of um, the different stages of cancer. They asked questions as to when should they test, where should they go. And it was, it was really informative. I learned from them, they learned from us. So it was, a, it was really good. Normally, men in general, <laughs> when it comes to asking them, even when I asked this morning, when last did you go to your doctor? When last did you have a general checkup? Oh, but we're not sick. And you see, that's where the problem lies. Unless we don't suspect that something is wrong, that we don't go and check. But you know, it's good that we encourage. We encourage you to get the screening done. With knowledge comes power. And actually knowing what you're about, especially your family history, some people don't even know whether their grandmother had 
high blood pressure, whether they, their father had diabetes, it's important that you know. Activities to mark Caribbean Wellness Day 2018 culminated with a health fair for staff on the 20th of September. Fawn Minville is a family health educator in the Ministry of Health. We have a staff initiative to get staff, to encourage staff to come out and get tested, get their screenings done, blood pressure, blood sugar, our nutrition people are here to do BMI, to do nutrition counseling. We have breast exams on offer as well as pap smears. Usually you find that health workers are out there taking care of the public and it is important that we take some time to take care of ourselves, to do our screenings as a preventative measure towards reducing our level of chronic illness in St. Lucia. The Ministry of Health and Wellness will continue to promote and advocate for healthy lifestyles, even after the month of observance has ended. Caribbean Wellness Day was held under the theme, Be Healthy, Stay Healthy, It's Your Job. From the Communications Unit in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Miguel Morissette reporting. St. Lucia's Minister of Responsibility for Tourism has been voted in as Chair of the Caribbean Tourism Organization, CTO. Honorable Dominic Fede was elected by representatives of member countries of the CTO at the State of Tourism Industry Conference, taking place at Atlantis Paradise Island, Bahamas. Minister Fede will serve a two-year term. Newly elected Chairman of the Caribbean Tourism Organization and St. Lucia's Minister with Responsibility for Tourism, Honorable Dominic Fede, said he was humbled and proud that his colleagues had placed their trust in him. The new chairman added that this provides an opportunity for the CTO countries to harmonize their strengths for a collective purpose. Honorable Fede also indicated that no effort should be spared in utilizing the collaborative efforts of member countries to advance the mandate of the CTO and tourism as a whole. The vote is in keeping with the CTO's constitution, which mandates that elections must be held every two years and that the chairman cannot serve consecutive terms. I've always felt that the Caribbean is one of the strongest and most iconic and aspirational travel brands in the world. but. Also, it is the most underutilized, and the opportunity exists now for us to ensure that we utilize the strength of the brand for the collective good of the destinations of the Caribbean. I think that the Caribbean is stronger than any one of our individual destinations, and it is important now for us to be strategic, even amid our own set of circumstances of limited budgets and uh, being from small jurisdictions uh, that have uh, lots of uh, fiscal issues such as high debt and um, low growth in some instances as well. So we've got to make sure that tourism be a catalyst to, 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 to transition the Caribbean out of uh, its current state. The CTO chairman named Chief Marketing Officer of the St. Lucia Tourism Authority, Tiffany Howard, as chairman of the CTO Board of Directors. According to the CTO Constitution, the board chairman and the chairman of the Council of Ministers and Commissioners of Tourism must come from the same member country. In addition to the election of the chairman, vice chairs were also elected to serve on the executive committee of the board of directors representing various subgroups. Curacao representing the Dutch Caribbean, Haiti representing the French Caribbean, the Bahamas and Jamaica representing the independent Caribbean community countries, and the Cayman Islands representing the British Overseas Territories. This committee will be completed with representatives from the private sector. And we have to ensure now that we spare no effort to ensure that we use our collaboration uh, at the CTO level to help to also um, advance the wider integration movement. I think we can all be proud if, um, you know, five, ten years from now, the CTO can be uh, seen in the same ilk of West Indies cricket and the University of the West Indies as success stories to unite the Caribbean further. The election was held at the Atlantis Resort on Paradise Island where the Caribbean Tourism Organization held its annual general meeting. This was ahead of the official opening of the State of the Tourism Industry Conference, which focuses on opportunities for enhancing the region's tourism product. From the Government Information Service, I am Janelle Norville. 
This is Nation Beat. Coming up, solution exporters look to break down barriers in the Cuban market and ensuring environmental justice through Escazu. Heavy storms mean flooding, and that means being prepared. With hand sanitizers, child-sized raincoats and boots, and insect repellent to protect your child from germs and waterborne illnesses. Plan for emergencies. Plan for your children. Welcome back. Organizers of the 2018 Icon Series are reporting satisfaction with the just-ended celebration of cultural icon Joseph Ramopolio. This year, an edutainment component that took the form of a school's roadshow introduced students to the work of Ramu Polio as well as exposed the influence of his sound to today's Denry segment. Anisia Antoine has the details. The Cultural Development Foundation, CDF, hosted the fourth annual cultural series which seeks to recognize individuals who have made a significant contribution to the creative industry in St. Lucia. The icon selected must entail a body of work that spans for more than 25 years. This year, St. Lucia's renowned folk musician, Joseph Ramo Polio, was the icon highlighted. Drinia Frederick, Director of Events and Production of the Cultural Development Foundation. We felt that it didn't make any sense to do it at a cultural center. But we go to his community where he is celebrated, he is loved. And also to fit into the entire theme of the Heritage Month where you dis rediscover St. Lucia. I'm sure many persons have not been to Bellevue and didn't know where that was. And I, as I've said before, it's the most beautiful place I've seen in St. Lucia. It's a community that's tight-knit and it's rich in culture and traditions. And even the way they, I mean, even the way in terms of their contemporary culture, um, there was a group called the Vie Tweezing Boys, which is a version of the Denry segment. So you begin to understand the elements that exist there. Cultural groups such as Helen Folk and Eastern Folk Dance gathered to celebrate Ramu Polio's music through dances and musical renditions. We had um, groups like Wajma. Um, who again influence of Ramu. I believe um, the lead singer Bellas is a relative of Ramu. Um, so you can see that musical tradition continuing. I thought say this, where his grandson um, was part of this band and they brought him on stage and at that age Ramu could still play and he still, well if to take a word from his bio, he has a music in his head. And um, for us, it was really a validation of why we're doing the Icon series, the importance. A culture crew organized by the CDF visited 12 schools from various parts of the island to educate students about the life of Ramu Polio. It's important that people are aware in the next generation. You can't build on something you don't know about. You can't um, innovate if you don't understand the tradition if you don't understand the culture and you have to understand what exists before before you can innovate have a full grasp of it before you can say okay well I'm moving from this point and I'm creating something else and that is the point that we're trying to make the cultural icon chosen for the year 2019 is Vincent Joseph Yudovic from the government information service I am Anisia Antoine reporting Officials from Export St. Lucia, TIPA, recently embarked on a four-day mission over in Cuba. The delegation, which also included officials from the St. Lucia's Ministry of Commerce, was in Cuba from Monday 17 September to Thursday 20 September and had as its mandate to identify and correct some of the inhibitors that may be keeping St. Lucian exporters from penetrating the Cuban market. Export St. Lucia, TIPA, has been actively pursuing the Cuban market since 2012. Many of the St. Lucian companies which have been exposed to the Cuban market over the years have gained the interest of Cuban buyers as well as government officials. However, with the exception of Baron Foods and Lucia Limited, none have been able to successfully penetrate the market and secure a contract with a buyer of interest. 
This lack of progress by the St. Lucian companies prompted Expon St. Lucia TIPA to complete a review of its interventions as well as those of the said companies in the Cuban market. According to Expo St. Lucia TIPA CEO Sunita Daniel, the mission was a resounding success and it allowed for the clearing up of a number of misconceptions about the Cuban market. So the main purpose of that visit was really to go into Cuba and speak with the officials there, speak with the persons who really can make the decisions and the changes for us, um, have those meetings with them and address the concerns that our individual companies would have had. So some of them would have had registration issues, some of them would have had um, difficulties with getting further orders and so that's what we went to do, to really look at what are the constraints that the companies are facing and to find out from the Cuban authorities how we can overcome those constraints for our exporters. Client manager with responsibility for the Northern Caribbean, including Cuba, Heidi Constantine Felix, says now armed with the information, clients can have a greater appreciation for the processes associated with Cuban market entry. Cuba is a different type of economy. We know it's centrally controlled, so the process to doing business with them is quite different from what our companies are used to. So there's a lot of registration with the companies. You need to operate through government of authorized importers. And you also, despite being certified internationally, your products also have to be tested within Cuba to make sure that they are suitable for that country. The client manager went on to indicate that the potential is there for greater collaboration between the two countries. I think now they they know the faces. The ambassador had been doing some work and seeing her again at their companies made them realize that we are serious, that we mean business. And so we do anticipate some more support from the side of the companies and the authorities in Cuba. They were happy to have us there and to dialogue and discuss with, with us. And so we believe that that will help the process. With the information now being filtered through to the clients of Export St. Lucia TIPA, it is anticipated that the necessary changes will be made to allow for greater penetration into the long elusive Cuban market. For Export St. Lucia TIPA, Jason Darius reporting. St. Lucia signs a historical agreement on environmental rights. St. Lucia joined other Latin American and Caribbean countries in signing the Escazo Agreement on September 27, 2018 at the United Nations General Assembly building in New York. The agreement offers the region an opportunity for full access to information, participation that embraces full consultation, and environmental justice. It is uh, the regional agreement on access to information, public participation, and justice in environmental matters, not only in the Caribbean, but also in Latin America. And it is called the Escazú Agreement because it was endorsed uh, in sometime in March at a high level segment in Escazú, which is a town in San Jose, Costa Rica. The agreement is relevant because first and foremost, it affirms the value of a regional and multilateral approach to sustainable development. Mm -hmm. It also aims to combat inequality and discrimination and to guarantee the rights of every person to a healthy environment as well as to sustainable development. In fact, it places equality at the core of sustainable development. This is the first environmental treaty in Latin America and the Caribbean containing specific provisions for the protection of the defenders of human rights in environmental matters. Whilst we do not have, we have organizations like the St. Lucia National Trust in St. Lucia mm -hmm. at the forefront of the environmental issues, and we have, I'm sure, a number of other groups, but you find that in places like, say, Honduras and Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, even Costa Rica, you find people have actually been killed wow. agitating for environmental rights. Mm -hmm. And so one of the main things about this regional agreement is that there are provisions made for protection for such persons. Mm. For, the, for the competent authorities and the countries to give adequate protection so that these people, if their lives are being threatened, mm -hmm. that there is some sort of provision in terms of the society and protect the, the, to protect their voice. 
The agreement aims to establish, among others, environmental rights as an essential human right. Because envir the environment and environmental rights mm -hmm. is essentially, in some countries, it is already part of the constitution as a human right. Mm -hmm. We have not reached that stage in St. Lucia, and I hopefully that we will get to that. But what we are claiming to do and what this agreement is trying to do is for us to now begin to see uh, environmental rights mm -hmm. as an essential human right. right, the right to a healthy environment as a mm -hmm. basic human right. Mm -hmm. The Escazo Agreement will be open for two full years ending on September 26, 2020. Tune in to the program Let's Talk to learn more about the Escazo Agreement. Let's Talk airs Thursday 4th October at 6.15 p.m. on NTN. That's a nation beat. Join us next time as we feel the pulse and heart of our community. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel. I am Janelle Norville.